Good afternoon, and welcome to the first episode of the third season of Between the Pillars, the Fisher Library's video podcast series. Uh, today is October 14th, 2022, and we're so happy to be back uh, with another season of the podcast where you'll get to meet Fisher staff, uh, you'll get to, we'll highlight some of our collections, and uh, we'll just generally chat about cool things in rare books and special collections. Uh, my name is John Shoesmith, and with me today is my colleague, David Fernandez, uh, a relatively frequent guest on the podcast. He's been on a couple of times, at least. Um, as you can see, we're still somewhat socially distanced here. Um, this is this, so we don't have to wear our masks while we're speaking. Uh, we're still trying to be... Uh, we're still trying to adhere to uh, to proper uh, proper COVID protocols, and most of us are still wearing masks at work. So we thought we'd just record it. Um, I'm up on 4M, our viewing stand, and David is down in our uh, East Reading Room, our seminar room. So uh, hopefully, in the next few weeks, we might be able to do be in the same room when we do these. Um, anyway, I want I asked David to be the first participant this season since a week from today, Friday, October 21st. The the Fisher will be hosting a special open house. Uh, to celebrate Latin American Heritage Month. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, spread the word, first of all, about the open house. If you are viewing this episode prior to uh, prior to October 21st, um, and David's going to show us some of the uh, some of the, so just a few of the highlights that will be uh, that will be part of this open house. So we do hope you can join us. We'll talk a little bit about that at the very end. Uh, so first off, welcome, David. Thank you for being the uh, the, the season's first guest. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, why we're honoring Latin American Heritage Month and why it's so important to, to you personally. Thank you, John, for having me and for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about this event. As you say, it's, it's, it's an important event. You know, the federal government established Latin American Heritage Month in the last 10 years, and the Fisher has participated in several locations. A few years ago, I did a video with uh, Professor Nestor Rodriguez to talk about some of our favorite books in the collections. And it's an important event uh, for various reasons, uh, but one of them is the Latin American community in Toronto and in Canada in general is a vibrant community and it's one mm -hmm. of the fastest growing uh, immig immigrant groups in, in the country. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the collections here at the Fisher um, in, in many ways reflect uh, the history of immigration, uh, the Latin American immigration to Canada. Um, and so um, it's an easy decision for me as a librarian uh, of a Latin American heritage uh, to put in all these efforts and, and time to um, create this display so people can come and learn and see um, what we have in the collections and, and hopefully see this, uh, themselves reflected in, 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 in some of the materials that will be displaying. Um, Maybe talk a little bit about your own background then, because you're 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 also an immigrant to Canada from uh, from Latin America. Yes, I'm from Venezuela. I moved to Canada in 2004. I started at UFT in 2005 and never left. I'm okay. still here, and and it's you know been an amazing journey. Um, yeah. So maybe just tell us a bit of about about some of our holdings. We're going to highlight a few in, in a couple of minutes, but maybe you could provide a kind of a quick overview of of some of the the key Latin American holdings that we have here at uh, at Fisher. I would say the main strength of our collections are colonial Latin American material or variety of material that supports you know research and learning in 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 this area. And so we have a good selection of Latin American imprints on indigenous languages mm -hmm. dating to the 16th century. Um, the first printing press arrived in the New World in Mexico City, or Tenochtitlan in 1539. Right. And we have early examples of works uh, printed and produced by the first generation of printers, not only in Mexico, but we also have material from uh, Lima and other parts of the Americas all the way to the 19th century that have been used uh, by students, researchers, and the general public to learn about uh, the history of Latin America in this right. period. Uh, so a lot of material on indigenous languages, that's kind of the main focus of, of the collections in prints that deal with um, uh, that process of learning, you know, Europeans learning indigenous languages for various purposes, and we're going to see an example in a bit. Uh, another area of the collections is Latin American literature, okay. uh, and that is in part because of uh, two major donations that were made um, uh, decades ago. 
The first is the Milton Buchanan collection of Spanish and Italian literature. And the second is the Professor Ralph Stanton collection of Portuguese yep. uh, history. And within those two collections, they, uh, both collectors um, had impressive uh, collections of Latin American literature. Um, and so we have many association copies and important books or books that sign or, or presented by important authors to either of these collectors, but also other collectors here at the university. And on display next week, we'll, we'll see some of those uh, items. And recently, I've uh, been working with, you know, uh, you know how we do acquisitions. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just the selector making these decisions, but as I've said in the past, a lot of the collections help us uh, make our own decisions as, as selectors. And of right. course, as librarians here at the Fisher, we teach, we curate events. So we have many opportunities to learn um, in the process of making uh, decisions for acquisitions. So having said that, in recent years, I've been acquiring uh, materials from imprentas populares or popular printing presses in the Americas. And two right. key examples are the Vanegas Arroyo and Jose Guadalupe Posada uh, collections of um, news flyers from Mexico, also pamphlets and amazing illustrated works from the late 19th century until the 1930s and 40s. And the second is the Taller de Grafica Popular collection right. uh, or the workshop of um, graphic works, um, which is uh, till this day, the most important um, militant artist group uh, producing uh, material that is not only anti-fascist, um, which aligns with the, our collecting areas in the Kenny collection, yeah. for example, uh, but also it's a great collection that gives us an idea of the history of the left-wing movements, in, not only in Mexico, but throughout the Americas. So, I mean, I, I'll save this question to the end because I was going to ask you sort of about, um, you know, how these materials are being used, but let, let's, let's, let's show some of the materials first. Um, so let's, what, what do you have for us up front? Up for, so up I'll front. Have, I have three items or three um, selections or let's call them highlights. The first, and, these, and these will be on display as well next Friday, yes? This will be on display definitely okay. uh, next week. The first is an item that just arrived yesterday. Wow. And its acquisition was made possible. Stop by the presses. The, I know, by the EDI initiative in the Central Library. Yep. And so we're very thankful to that committee for uh, supporting uh, this acquisition. And this is the first and only edition of Pedro de Arenas Vocabulario Manual de las Lenguas Castellana y Mexicana. So it's a vocabulary of Spanish and Nahuatl, right. published in 1611. Okay. It, it has uh, what we can assume, safely assume it's, uh, it's a, a very early binding or the original binding has some marks of provenance. Again, this is a new acquisition, so I still have to spend mm -hmm. some time with this copy, but I've seen uh, another copy in the past. And uh, when I saw this one available, I, I quickly jump at, 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 you know, trying to get it for us. The and size tells us something about it too. I mean, the portability aspect. Exactly, of it. This is, and this um, speaks to the way this particular vocabulario was edited. Um, so we don't know much about Pedro de Arenas, uh, but just going through the work, we quickly realized that the purpose of this vocabulario was um, different from the other vocabularios published uh, in the 16th century. Um, right. I don't know if some of the viewers will remember last time I was, uh, or the first time I participated in the podcast, I showed the first, the second edition of Molina's uh, Vocabulario, published in 1571. Uh, this is quite different from, from that vocabulario because of the intention. This is mainly, uh, this is a very practical vocabulario um, used for whoever, um, not just missionaries, but whoever could have access to a copy like this um, and take it with them to interact with indigenous populations in central Mexico or different parts of Mexico uh, who spoke Nahuatl. Right. And as we go through the book, uh, so for example, uh, words for greetings, um, lo que se suele decir y preguntar a los enfermos. 
eh, things that you may ask and say to sick people. Right. Eh, lo que se suele decir consolando a una persona. What would you say to someone when you want to console them or give them eh, mm -hmm. some relief? Eh, so eh, the Fisher, this item connects to many collections at the Fisher Library. And I think one of them would be our travel guides. Right. Um, as yep. you know, the genre travel guides, it's much later, even though there are some early examples, uh, but many of them would have a practical vocabulary in the end. So you right. could take it with you and be in, in communicate and interact with the locals. Um, this, in my opinion, is a very early example of that. Uh, tied to the realities of early colonial life in, right. in Mexico. Right. It's a fascinating book. It has some, you know, uh, marks of readership. And, and so I can't wait to catalog it so others uh, can access it and see it. But and you were saying people it's, come you, and see you it next saying, week. You were saying it's pretty rare, too, in terms of number of copies. Yeah, I think it still exists. Fewer, yeah, I think there are fewer than five copies in institutions. Wow. Uh, I, this summer, I was lucky enough to see uh, the copy at the John Carter Brown Library in Providence, uh, okay. in Brown University. Great. So, what else do, do we have? See another item? Yes, please. I'm going to show another item that's going to bring us to the 20th century, a selection of items Great. illustrated by a very well known uh, Mexican. Illustrator, and uh, maybe I'll remove some of the a bit of a glare. Yeah, and so these are books illustrated by D.R. Diego Rivera, okay. a very important uh, Mexican artist, um, mostly known or well known for his murals. Yep. So he was an important um, member of the muralista movement in Mexico. And, but he also illustrated books. And so I've been trying to collect um, his uh, books illustrated by him. And here's a selection of works that will end up in the Kenny collection because uh, most of them deal in one way or another um, with in literatures and culture related to uh, socialist and labor movements in, in Mexico, which he was a, a big part of and, and supported of. So here's one example. Here's another right. example also illustrated by him, Diego Rivera. And so, yeah, again, people would know him better for his um, impressive murals, you know, retelling Mexican history. Uh, but as, a, as an illustrator of books, uh, he also contributed to this tradition in Mexico and in Latin America in general. Would, Fondo would de Cultura Popular. Would these publications have fairly large runs or, or and where it would they be sold? Yeah, it depends. So the, in looking at the publishers, um, so Fondo de Cultura Popular would have published, you know, in higher numbers than some of the smaller uh, publications. So this would have been funded by the government and, right. and, and they're part of, you know, campaigns in the 50s and 60s by the Mexican government to uh, promote the culture of the book. And, right. and, and so they created different, um, you know, collections under the idea of like popular culture. And, right. and, and that's another reason why he was uh, a participant of, 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 uh, of these initiatives. Right. Here we have a famous one, it's a, a, it's a play under the name of Cuauhtemo, one of the early um, um, leaders uh, during the colonial period that um, indigenous leader. And here it, it's not just the cover that he illustrated, but he also did the lettering right. and the illustrations inside. Cuauhtemo, Tragedia, la escribió Joaquín Méndez Rivas, uh, published in Mexico okay. in 1945. Look at this. Oh, that's great. So a lot of the illustrations, of course, are in, yeah. inspire in indigenous uh, artistry and yeah. in, in depictions of art. And even we can look at examples of some of the early uh, Mexican manuscripts we have in the collection, also known as codices or Meso Mesoamerican codices. And you know we'll see a resemblance between those traditions here. And the last example is, I think there's another play and it's three national heroes uh, depicted in the, um, in the cover. I think this is from 1925, an earlier edition than the other two. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, do you see it well? I'll probably not because of the glare. I'll remove it here. Just how about now? Yeah. Is that better? A little bit better. Yeah. Okay. This should work now. Yeah, it's a little, still a little it's hard to see. Yeah, it's a bit too bright, maybe. Yeah. But it's a line drawing uh, yep. depicting three. Oh, there we go. Uh, yep. Uh, three heroes. Um, I love I love the the seeming simplicity of the drawings themselves. Yeah, they are quite beautiful. Nineteen twenty five. Right. You see, so it's another government agency issuing uh, this work, uh, Secretaria right. de Educación Pública, the uh, Public uh, Education Secretariat. Then the next, we, we're going to stay in the twentieth century, aren't we? Yes, we're going to stay in the twentieth century, and we're going to look at materials in part inspired by the Muralista movement. And uh, I wrote a piece for the Halcyon, the library newsletter, mm -hmm. uh, where I talk a little bit about the importance of um, this collective, the Taller de Grafica Popular, who's still active today and right. hopefully will be able to acquire some examples of their work as well. Uh, um, so, so maybe give see. a bit of background then on, on the collective itself. Yeah, so the collective was founded in the late 1930s, I believe in 1937, and it, and it attracted uh, artists from all over Mexico, uh, but other parts of uh, Latin America and also from the United States. Right. Um, you know, artists that were committed to the civil rights movement, for example, went to Mexico and illustrated works on that topic and, and, and were published. Uh, I don't think we have any examples yet, but you know, one day we will. Right. <laughs> and, and so the Taller de Grafica Popular issued numerous uh, portfolios like this from 1937 to 1968, mm -hmm. including this very important collection of 146 uh, linocut prints uh, okay. by 25 members of the collective. And so they're all listed uh, here. Mm -hmm. And they all deal with the history of Mexico from the conquest to modern times, right. with a strong focus on stories of resistance uh, to colonial and imperial powers. So that, uh, in, in essence, um, captures what the collective did in terms of their uh, artistic output. Right. Um, they produce uh, mainly linocots, Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a description of all the prints. Um, they produce mainly line of cuts, but they also uh, um, issued works in uh, as offset lithography and, and woodcut and wood right. engravings as well. But right. line of cut was their preferred uh, method for various reasons. But one, it was more economical right. uh, to produce this line of cuts. So here we have a grabado or a, a a line of cut by Leopoldo Mendes, who was one of the most important members of the collective and who a mentor, you know, generations of, of artists that, you know, came in and out of the collective over its, its life. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's, they're quite amazing. Uh, some of the examples, and they varied in style. Um, you know, all of them are um, printed in black with color papers, but if people come in here, so see grabado de Adolfo Quintero, an example. You know, the, the did, did they and, did they focus in on particular areas or themes or no? It's it, it, it focus on Mexican history, right? Okay. So a telling of the history of Mexico from the time of the conquest in the fifteen twenties. Right until uh, the time when this was published. Uh, this is it's from 1960s. Right. Um, this is one of the um, um, grabado de Elena Huerta, one of the female members of the collective. Uh, right. Uh, so here's wow, <laughs> by Pablo O'Higgins, another important member. And right. you see this figure here is uh, uh, protecting uh, codice from uh, the fire. Right. Wow. Yeah. This is spectacular. Yes. Right? And so it's this fit in the collection for various reasons or in different ways. Uh, it will become part of the Kenny collection, documentary history of socialism and communism and, and related movements. 
not only in Canada, but globally, but as an example of um, graphic arts or mm -hmm. visual culture uh, tied to ideas that date back to the colonial period. Um, and so they've, they've already been used in, in classes in the history department, for example, right. uh, to explore like um, ideas of like say posters and propaganda um, and social movements or movements of like human rights in Latin America. So this type of materials are amazing uh, for supporting, uh, you know, learning in these areas. Yeah, I'd, I'd suggest anybody that's interested in, 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 this, in this particular collective, David has written an excellent article in the Halcyon, which we'll post it in the show notes um, down below as well. So from the last issue. So maybe just go back on camera because I got a couple of, couple of final questions. You sort of, you sort of talked a little bit about this as well, because I mean, obviously we don't buy collections, not entirely to satisfy um, our own interests, um, but maybe you could tell us then, I mean, how you, you touched upon it already, how the collections are used. How do you foresee the collections being used in the future by maybe people that have coming upon this material for the first time and realizing that it's not here at the Fisher Library? Well, my hope is to see more members of the general public uh, right. use their collections um, as a, academic library or in a library that is part of a, a university, we have no challenges or not a lot of problems bringing in, you know, students from right. the university and local universities. Um, but I would like to explore and do more events and projects in the future where we're, you know, building new collections or, right. or expanding on existing a connections, I should say, right. with members of the community and, mm -hmm. and in order to explore different things. So for example, um, our collections of early printed books on indigenous languages will be digitized mm -hmm. um, in order to um, support those that are um, learning indigenous languages for the first time or right. being part of projects that are trying to revitalize uh, those languages. Right. Um, so those are kind of the projects that I would love to support in, in the near future. And I guess an open house like this really does afford people the opportunity to come in to see what we have um, and to tell people that, you know, you we are part of this community. We're not just, you know, obviously we're an academic institution, but ultimately we are part of the Toronto community. We're part of the community of um, not just Latin American, but so many other different um, different 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 communities in, in the city of Toronto. So, so I think they, these open houses, I think, are something we're probably going to be doing a lot more of um, going forward in the next uh, in the next few years. So, remind us again. So it's next Friday, October twenty first. What 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 are the times? From ten to four, and please join us. I'll be here all day. So, uh, those who know me. Uh, know that I'll be talking all day yes. and, and showing uh, the different aspects of the collection that uh, I have developed over the last 10 years, but also other librarians before me worked on and, and, and people will be impressed. Uh, yes. You, you the, don't do a very variety good job. of materials. You don't do a very good job of hiding your passion for this material. <laughs> oh, why hide it? Uh, so <laughs> exactly. I hope people, I hope people um, join us or tell friends and, and families and and just an opportunity to you know come and say hi and see these mm. amazing collections. I should remind people as well if if they are watching this prior to the twenty first, we're also going to be open a special Saturday opening on the twenty second. Um, I'll be here. Um, I'll be here doing some tours. We figured we'd open it up for the open up the exhibition area as well. Um, for, for between ten and four on October twenty on October twenty second. So if you're uh, watching it uh, prior to that, please come to the library for that special Saturday uh, Saturday viewing of the exhibition. So thank you, David. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, next week as well. I hope I can help you out a little bit on the Friday. Um, we'll be back in two weeks time. I'm not sure what the next who the next guest is or the next topic is, but um, I'm in the moment I'm, I'm recruiting people for the remainder of the season. So thank you again for joining us. We're excited to be, again be back at the library. Um, we are open again Monday to Friday, nine to five. So um, please come to visit us, come use our materials. Um, and we hope to see you out here at the library, not just the 21st and the 22nd, but uh, going forward um, any day during Monday to Friday. So thanks again, David. Hope everyone has a lovely Thank you, John. Week, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Bye. Thanks.